See, see, fear and rejection is a closing off action, whereas we are not actually separated from each other. So when we're here in this experience of separation, we close off even more because I'm afraid, oh my gosh, I need to close off. But love is open. It is totally open. It's totally accepting. It's so accepting that it even allows us to choose to come into an experience of separation for the opportunities. Like it's not going to say no. Love accepts. It allows. It's totally accepting. So surrender is an intention that is in alignment with that type of acceptance to life. Hi, welcome to NDE Talk. I'm your host, Natalie Higgins. Today's guest is Christian Sundberg, who joins us today for a Q&A session. It is a little different from the rest of the videos that I've posted previously. However, we thought it would be more important to shed the light on topics such as why are we here? What is your purpose? And how can we help expand your consciousness? I will link in the description his website that is full of many videos on his pre-birth memories and his book, A Walk in the Physical. So please pause this video if you haven't heard of him before. Watch some of the videos, read a bit of his book and get to understand him as a person and then jump back onto the podcast and get ready for an amazing Q&A that is sure to awaken many, many more people and expand your consciousness. So without further ado, I welcome you Christian Sundberg. So Christian, for the viewers watching, um, could you give them a little bit of background to who you are and where you came from and how you are the you that you are today? <laughs> Thank you, Natalie, for having me on the show. It's such a funny question because we are not actually the human story. So, you know, when we ask someone, how did you get here? Who are you? You know, we're asking what forms did you experience in, the, in this life leading up to this moment. But so on the surface, you know, I'm a 42 year old male living in the USA and I have a beautiful family and I work a full time regular job and all that. But 12 years ago, I had an awakening experience in which um, over a, so I began meditating over the course of several months and I began to have non physical experiences. I had some out-of-body experiences, and I also had pre-birth memory return to me. I've shared my pre-birth memory story um, a number of other times, but basically I remember choosing this life and why, and I remember the process of incarnating into this experience as Christian, as this human, and why, why I came, you know, the, the, the purpose of my coming. And it's been an amazing journey. And then I, I started sharing that story only a few years ago, about four years ago now, maybe I didn't share it for the first eight years or so, because, you know, I'm like a working professional. It's the kind of thing you don't talk about, yeah. <laughs> but I felt very like, um, compelled to share. And I did, I also worked, uh, over six years to write a book that I published last year. It's called a walk in the physical and congratulations. Um, thank you. And I really, um, I felt spirit led for, to, to write this book. I don't, I feel even that I didn't actually even fully write it. I just made it available mm -hmm. and, um, and it's done ex very well. It is available for free. It's not about money. It's not about selling the book. Um, but I, um, I came to this moment here now in, in life where I just, I, I need to share, <laughs> like, I can't not share after, Sharing my story and publishing the book, I've met so many amazing people around the world. There are so many people out there who are aware that we are not just this. We are not just this human journey. There is an incredible opportunity to help remind each other and to empower each other. You know, because when we know who we truly are, even in a little bit, we're just so empowered. Our true nature is so powerful and beyond all the limitations and fears of earth. We are beings of incredible love and freedom and joy and creativity. That is what we are every day. We've just become deeply immersed in this human experience for a while. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Christian. 
So for you guys who are watching today, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. And that is a question and answer series with Christian in regards to his pre-birth memory. However, we're not going to go over um, his experience. And so if you do want to know a little bit more about this, please pause the video now, jump onto his website, which I will link below check out some of the videos that he has and you will be informed on his experience and then pop back over to the question answers and um, let's see what we have for you today. So thank you for sharing that with us, Christian. And I will start with my first question. Okay, can we start by um, going right to the beginning? And that is to ask, who are we really? And also, can we talk a little bit about consciousness as well? Yeah, those two questions are very much related <laughs> because who we really are is beyond description, but the closest word. So, okay, so before I say any of this, I just have to disclaim that language is incredibly limiting. There are just no words we can use to possibly describe our higher natures or who we really are, the, the larger spiritual context, the nature of God. <laughs> These things cannot be articulated because words are form, they are symbols, and symbols are a part of the earth play. <laughs> They're a part of our local context. And our symbols are based in assumptions of earth that don't actually apply to our true nature, assumptions like discrete location being separate and linear time. So, I just have to say that up front because we really cannot possibly put words on it. But if we have to just put a word on what we really are, the, the simplest word would be consciousness or life itself with a capital L <laughs> or spirit, which are synonymous. So, so the you that's listening today, you're you. You're the, you're the you that feels like you to you. You know, you're the, the most you, you. You think that that you means the forms of life, perhaps <laughs> the body and the story and the, the job and the kids and the, and the health challenges and all the rest. No, actually, you are the consciousness experiencing those things. You are you engaged in that context of form. And that is a huge distinction because when we're not engaged in this context of form, the totality of what we are is so vast, so deep, and so beautiful. It's just, it's just so beyond language what we are. You could say that we are the substance of the stars, not just physically, but that which gave rise to the stars. You know, we're, we're the substance of love and joy itself, like alive and capable of so much more than we see even here in the physical. So it's very difficult to articulate what we are, but we are multidimensional beings having a physical experience. That's, that's what we are in short. <laughs> very well said. Very, very well said, Christian. Okay, moving on to the next question. Now that we understand what we are and who we are, my next question would be, and it's a two-part question, why are we here? And also, could you explain a bit on how we chose to come here? So not why we, like why we chose to come here, but how we chose to come here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the human experience offers the opportunity for a very unique, well-defined context through which we can make choices. And through making choices, which is wielding intent, is actually intent prior to choice. Choice making happens within a context. Intent is the movement of consciousness in a context. We're here to wield intent, make choices in the context, and then grow through the integration of those experiences and from the results of our choice making. So you could say we're here to evolve the quality of our intention towards love and away from fear, to overcome fear, and to integrate experience. Those are the two most simple ways, I think, to put what the purpose of the physical incarnation is, is to be able to make choices and see the results of those choices and learn about ourselves and to actualize our true natures in the context. And it's also to come to terms with these experiences and integrate them into what we are. We're like experienced integrators. You know, it's like, this is like what we are. <laughs> we go, we have experiences and we integrate them into what we are and we learn and we grow. And as we do that, the learning, by the way, is not intellectual learning. It's a learning of the being by being. 
And yeah. as we do that, and as we do that, we expand what we are and we also help expand all that is because we are a part of all that is. So when we as a drop in the ocean expand, the whole ocean actually expands. So we're performing a service, you could say, by being on the cutting edge and the cutting edge of, of physicality. And we dive into this very, very, very dense context of the physical to participate in that process. So this is a very, very alien state, actually, by comparison to what we actually are, because here we experience a very high degree of separation that is not native to who we really are. And that level of separation and the level of the constraints that we're wearing is very high and, and potentially very difficult. <laughs> yeah. And so because the constraints are so high, the opportunity is so high. Um, so that's, that's a short, short comment as to why we're here. So how do, how do we choose? So, I mean, we're all very, very unique beings. You could say we're each like a universe unto ourselves of, of, uh, rich history and qualities and capacity and oh it's so beautiful we're all so unique so we each have our own reasons our own purposes but in general we come to participate in expansion as i just mentioned to grow in love and to overcome fear which is also synonymous with participating in expansion or to express love and actualize love in some way perhaps even for someone else and the the how it, that we do that is to okay so in order to become to be human we have to accept the constraints that go along with being physical and yeah. the so the constraints what i mean is the constraints that are worn by consciousness by you so your consciousness your spirit adopts takes on it's like wearing a heavy cloak or something like putting on a heavy cloak or maybe putting on a spacesuit of the body but it's not that the body is fundamentally real it, the body is just a part of this rich context and we we adopt constraints in order to engage this context and we call those constraints in part the veil the veil is just a term we use for the fact that we don't remember what we are while we're here <laughs> except for we you get, christian you are told, the exception <laughs> no, no 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 i only have a tiny little no no we i am very much veiled and it, the veiling is like an obscuring of our true nature. So we no longer remember the fullness of who we are and we no longer have conscious day-to-day -day access most of the time to like all the other reality systems in which we're engaged, all the other portions of our self of which there are many portions. You know, we, we tend to be totally focused on the human experience, but that's what the veil does. It enables an almost complete immersion into the, the matrix, you could say, into the, yeah. <laughs> the simulation of the physical. Awesome. Yeah. Christian, do you believe in the Bible or religion, or is it simply a part of this reality which we are in now? Because it seems to me that uh, saying that there's a heaven and a hell is like putting restraints on the other side. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. And that can't be all that there is. So, first of all, to your question about the Bible, I'm very. I'm very sensitive to try to speak to the religion of others because religion is very personal and very meaningful for very many people. And it's not, it's not simply a matter of care categorically accepting or denying it. I will say that religion, it, however, is another set of human forms. That is ideas, objects, rituals, dogmas. And through those forms, many people can potentially successfully pursue the divine, their relationship with the divine. Yeah. Others may not. It has to do with how we use the form. You know, whether it be a hammer <laughs> or a religion, we choose how we use our form. And it's the quality of our intent behind it that is what matters. So do we do it in a loving way? Do we do it for the purposes of pursuing the divine and actually growing towards love or are we doing it for ego which is fear yeah uh, you know what how are we using it so so i, I i'm not going to categorically you know throw throw one uh belief system in one direction or the other but i will say that human belief in general it can't possibly articulate the fullness of the truth of our higher natures it's just not the 
nature of form. No words <laughs> can do that. No set of beliefs can do that because we transcend form entirely. We transcend all of duality. So how can something within duality be, you know, like the full truth? It's just, it's not how, it's not how it works. Okay, so as for heaven and hell, there are many, many reality systems and I'm not qualified to speak to them. <laughs> I've had experiences in higher systems and in, in astral systems and di different systems of reality that I'm careful to put language on. We have vastly oversimplified the richness and complexity of the, uh, the other side. You know, yes. we, call, we tend to think, we tend to think there's earth and then there's the afterlife. Yeah. If, right? if, if there is, if there's an afterlife, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we know there's earth, but if there's an afterlife, it must be this one other. No, earth is like just one of many, many possible experiences you can have. Maybe uh, just a couple crude metaphors, like tuning into a certain radio frequency on your radio. Or maybe logging into a certain video game on Steam. That's like a video game service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You might yeah, have a yeah. <laughs> hundred games in your library. You log into one. You know, I, I'm just using crude metaphors. I'm just saying that the the context beyond Earth is incredibly vast and rich. Even just in our universe, our universe is huge, and the Earth is just one tiny little portion. Tiny, tiny little portion. Yeah. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of billions of stars and hundreds of billions of galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of stars. And Earth is one tiny little, and that whole thing is one tiny little piece of a much, much, much bigger whole. So, so it's not so simple as to just frame as, you know, as a heaven and a hell. There are very, very beautiful heavenly realms. There are experiences in non-physical systems that are thought responsive that, that can be quite hellish depending on our own nature and our own fear. So it's okay that we have some crude metaphors, but it's much bigger than those metaphors. So Christian, let's talk about homesickness. And I don't want to um, bring you back to that place, Yeah. but do you ever feel overbearingly, you know, homesick? Do you ever yeah, long absolutely. to go back? Oh my goodness, yes. No, absolutely. Homesickness is uh, something I deal with very much every day. It's very tangible. I think we all actually feel it to some degree or another, whether it's more or less conscious. <laughs> mm. We all kind of yearn for a place we've forgotten. Um, in my case, I, I very much, I, I very much feel it. Uh, I, I feel like that's one of the benefits of the veil actually is that it permits us to not be debilitated by homesickness <laughs> because yeah. we're able to focus entirely here and not even remember the, the incredible beauties and freedom of the of the higher realms so now i definitely deal with that every day but i um i also am aware of the incredible opportunity of allowing and integrating the distance between there and here so now that we're physical even my homesickness is something that is an element of contrast that i can uh, use you know allow so that i don't need to resist even being in this state of great limitation of being human i don't need to when I'm able to do that fully, there is that peace and that joy of who we really are can be even here. And, and then there's no homesickness, of course, because we are what we are. We, we always are what we are. Awesome. But yeah, I definitely experienced that. And I've heard that from many other people who have reached out. I've met so many people that experience poignant homesickness. I, I totally get it. You're, yeah. yeah, that's not strange. <laughs> that's I not mean, strange. me, for instance, I asked that because I also have a longing to yeah. feel what, you know, near death experiences talk about that all loving, all encompassing light, just feeling of being held. It's like, I want that. I want that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, since you've been able to remember all knowing, the all expansive love and infinite source, to then a very low vibrational state at some point you would have had to just surrender so could you talk a bit a, a bit about you know the importance of surrendering and letting go of what does not serve us here you know whether it be a bad relationship or that decision we should have made or whatever situation it may be how can we learn to let go that's a great question so
Okay. Tom Campbell, the physicist and consciousness explorer, uh, in his work, he has a model in which he talks about what he describes as three primary paths of spiritual growth. Um, one of them is the path of knowledge, which is really getting in there and integrating things the old messy hard way. One of them is the path of service, which is focusing the quality of your intent on serving others. And the last is the path of surrender. Um, I'm mentioning that because that model's really helped me. I didn't appreciate the importance of surrender early in my awakening. Okay, so one of the main things we're here to do is to face fear. And the reason that facing fear is a primary element of what we're doing here is fear is Okay, so if we process fear, that is synonymous with the expansion of love, because love is our true nature. Love is what we really, really always are, love and joy. But when we resist the physical, and we resist the circumstance and the stories we've put on it, because <laughs> we're putting the stories on it. When we resist all that, we experience fear because, it, and, and, the, and it's, they're tied, the resistance and the fear are connected. Fear just means yet unevolved in this. It's just some aspect of reality we haven't fully come to terms with, either reality or some aspect of the perception and story that we've put on it. Like, I feel powerless. I don't like that. I'm not okay with that. I reject that. And then the ego rises up, of course, to try to fix the problem. Oh, you're not powerless because look, you've got money or you've got, you're not powerless because look, you can control this person next to you, whatever. Okay, all that is connected to this important idea of surrender because surrender is moving your intention in the direction of saying, I will not reject. I do not reject. I will allow everything, all that is, all circumstance, all story, all feeling, all the feeling that I didn't want to feel. And when we do that, it comes up because now you're not rejecting it anymore. So you're going to feel it, but that's okay. That's wonderful. It's wonderful because that is processing fear. You see, because then you're no longer rejecting. You're allowing the feeling, you're allowing yourself to know the fullness of whatever it is that you've been pushing away. And when you do that, you open to reality and to all that is. See, See, fear and rejection is a closing off action, whereas we are not actually separated from each other. So when we're here in this experience of separation, we close off even more because now I'm afraid, oh my gosh, I need to close off. But love is open. It is totally open. It's totally accepting. It's so accepting that it even allows us to choose to come into an experience of separation for the opportunities. Like it's not going to say no. Love accepts, it allows, it's totally accepting. So surrender is an intention that is in alignment with that type of acceptance to life. <laughs> we, we're, we don't reject life, we surrender to it, we allow it. And when we do that, life opens up to us in return because now we can feel again fully. Now all of a sudden everything around us may be very intense, especially for those of us who are more sensitive. <laughs> But it's also full of so much potential, so much beauty, so much opportunity. That is a part of the expansion that we're here to do. I felt that on so many levels. Thank you so much for sharing that. Absolutely yeah. incredible. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears here. All right. Let's talk about belief systems, programming. So we've grown up in a world that has programmed us to be a certain way. Oh, yes. To, yes. <laughs> to worry about what we look like. Are we enough? Did I earn enough in order to be a better person to society? How can we break away from these belief systems? Yeah. That question is very personal because each one of us are unique in our path of meeting the physical will be very unique, very personal. And overcoming conditioning, and not even overcoming, um, becoming aware of conditioning and growing past it can be a very personal process to each, for each person. Okay, so it is definitely true that we are conditioned here on earth. 
form is handed to us and we're told identify with this form. I'm just speaking generally. The form could be some story. You know, you got to get good, good grades because look, if you get good grades, now you've got value. You know, that was something I used to, I mean, in my early days, I, I believed, I didn't even recognize that I believed it, but I worked really hard to, to do well in school because now I must have value. I didn't realize I had a sense of lack of self-worth. So I tried to prove to myself that I had worth by doing the things my parents told me I should do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we all do, we do that. Especially because when you're a young child, your parents are like gods, you know, <laughs> in your environment yeah. and you take on what they hand you and, and what they teach you very deeply. So one comment I'll make though, about how we can become aware of that to grow past it is uh, a specific suggestion. And that is meditation actually, because meditation through meditation, we gain greater familiarity with what we really are, which is awareness of self, mm. not the thoughts, not the stories. As we do that, there's this beautiful space that's created not because we're trying to create a space, but just because we're growing an awareness of the truth of who we really are. And then we can see the stories more for what they are as we also grow in the ability to feel what we really are. Like the depth of consciousness itself is profoundly full of joy and worthiness and love and freedom. And I mentioned those words in, in this context because on earth, many people's conditioning is that they're conditioned to believe they're not worthy unless they're not, they're not lovable unless they're not free. You know, all these negative self-perceptions that we buy into that are not in alignment with the truth of our spirit. <laughs> so that's why we suffer, <laughs> you know, because now we're buying into these stories that are not like, oh, I'm not free. I have to go to work every day. I got to pay the bills. I don't have money. I'm not free. And then that perception of not freedom takes you vibrationally even further away from the truth of who you really are because you're you're entertaining a perception of not being free. Now that's that's okay. We're here to we're here to learn through that to grow to and where else can you experience not being free? Here, this is where you, this is where you do it. <laughs> <laughs> but our true nature is free. It's very free. So as we like as we as we meditate and as we gain in mindfulness that awareness of who we really are grows in tangibility. And we simultaneously be able, can be, we begin to be able to identify, oh, oh, that condition, that's just a thought that I've had 27,000 times. I have it every day. <laughs> yeah. I just have this thought, it keeps coming up. You're not worthy or a feeling or a feeling attached to a thought, whatever. <laughs> thought objects, feeling objects come up and we're like, oh, I'm the experiencer of that. Now that step is a huge step because one of the main things we're doing on earth is associating with form for better or for worse. <laughs> and so the association with form hurts if the form is negative. And so being able to take a step back and experientially find I'm not the form. I'm not the story. I am me. I'm the experiencer. I'm the knower of the story. That is liberating it's it's profoundly liberating yeah okay and i wanted to talk a little bit while we're still there about meditation as well because yeah. some of the people watching may not have meditated before or they simply can't meditate they can't close yeah. off the monkey brain what yeah. are some tips you could give us um in order to help better quiet yeah, sure. the mind yeah so when i first started meditating i did it because i was listening to Tom Campbell's lectures and started reading his thousand page tome. And he recommended meditation as a form of investigation. Just go see what you are. Yeah. I very much wholeheartedly agree with that. And recommend that now use meditation as a form of objective, hundred percent objective investigation. Just go look at your awareness itself when not engaged in thought, <laughs> just go look at what it is. But anyway, when I started the monkey mind, oh my goodness, you know, I remember <laughs> sitting down for 10 minutes. I, you know, not getting anywhere probably, but at, for 10 minutes of trying to focus on one neutral object in my mind, I realized, A, this is very hard. But B, <laughs> after even 10 minutes, I actually had a, like a little bit of just a tiny sense of peace, just a little bit. And I was like, mm. oh, that's really nice. 
So Tom Campbell recommended to continue doing so without judgment. And I think that's very important because you can't see the, the, the bountiful rewards of meditation after 10 minutes or an hour or several hours or you know, weeks of meditation. It's not how it works. You practice the use of your intention to focus on something neutral to start so that you regain the ability to choose your focus. Otherwise, you're yeah. lost in the stream of thoughts all day. All day becomes an unconscious. It's like, like each thought is like a dream. I have to eat lunch now. I have to pay the bills. I have to go pick up my child. You know, thought, 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 thought. When you're thinking the thought, you are, forgive the language, just the being who's thinking the thought. That's mm. the nature of a thought. <laughs> yeah. But as you meditate and practice on focusing on something neutral, eventually you can you can drop the object of focus and just be fully alert and fully present in this moment and as you do that you discover i, I can't just i can't describe this because it's not a thought it's not a new thought you experientially discover you become the, the observer thoughts. of yourself yes you become the observer of the complex the mind to body complex of form that's going on now that's not an act of separation because i think to the human we might think oh that means i have to sit there and my goal is to become the observer no actually this is a very much unifying fully present experience in which first you gain the ability to focus on something neutral for, for and then you put in the time weeks months it's okay don't judge yourself for the progress you just do it every day 40 minutes a day, something like that. And you just put in that time. And then eventually, once you gain the ability to focus on something neutral without the stream of thoughts bowling you over, <laughs> <laughs> you can let go of the object and just look squarely at your awareness itself, your life itself, the living aliveness. It feels like in your body, but actually your body is occurring in it, in the aliveness. Yeah. So you just dwell in the aliveness. And at first, that may, like when you first start this process, it may feel like you're going towards nothing. But in fact, that aliveness is full, not empty. But that's the best way I can put it. I don't know if I spoke to your original question. I went kind of on a tangent there. No, but, but that I, rec was beautiful. I, I recommend set aside, setting aside time every day. I recommend a simple meditation exercise in my book that works for me. I highly recommend meditating. Uh, there's a phrase, I don't know where this originated. I think it's some kind of Asian phrase that I, I love. It's, it's just this cute phrase, meditate for an hour a day, unless you don't have time and then meditate for two. Two hours. Yeah. I've heard of that thing. I love, I love that. that. Gets me every It's so time. true though, because <laughs> you think the story that's going on in your life right now is very important. Mm. It's okay. It's actually not as important as you think. You can, <laughs> you can put down the story and dwell fully in the present moment and in life itself. And that is very rejuvenating and yeah. freeing. The body heals actually. Um, the you know there's just this there's an there's an energizing effect not because you're trying but just because as you gain as you are no longer associated with all these dense clunky painful forms and you're allowing a space for that aliveness life rises up because life is what you are beautiful thank you so much <laughs> so i wanted to talk about another topic that is pretty huge at the moment there's a huge energy shift that is currently happening here on earth. Now, as we are going through transition and awakening of the collective consciousness from old belief systems, patterns, and into unknown territory, since all we knew is now irrelevant. So this new awakening, things are getting a little bit rattled. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so... What are some insights that you can share in order for us to keep our light during these times and during this huge energy shift? How can we stop ourselves from being overwhelmed? Excellent. That's a, that's a fantastic question. So there is an awakening going on on earth. 
I remember being aware of it in my pre-birth experience. It was very, it was just very normal. It was known. It wasn't, you know, it was just like, that's, that's the act of the play that we're in kind of thing. Mm. There has been a significant shift in the energy of the human collective consciousness in the last 25 years, especially. Um, it's very, it's very uh, fast compared, you know, like for the scope of what we're doing, it's, yeah. it's quick per unit time. <laughs> and as that happens, like you said, there is an incredible amount of thought momentum in the collective consciousness that is going to need to be processed. Yeah. And we have a lot of, we have a lot of fear-based thought patterns that are deep in the human collective consciousness. We have a huge amount of us versus them ingrained into our, our collective consciousness. Us versus them, meaning all of forms of it, you know, my tribe versus your tribe, my team versus your team, my nation mm. versus your nation, my skin color versus your skin color. Yeah. That's just an example. It's just an example. There's, there's many elements of this. That's just one that is a good example because right now the vibration is getting to the point where mm, we, we are not aligning with that so much now. And so all those old patterns of racism and sexism and, you know, uh, sexual rights, you know, all the, all the, all the, uh, the group <laughs> judgments, they're coming up and, and being, and being re-experienced and processed in, you know, in a way that may seem very tumultuous. So the play may seem tumultuous on the surface. This is, this is the important thing because we're moving the objects around and because we're dealing with a lot of, like, we're taking all these patterns in our collective consciousness and we're reevaluating them and we're trying to really evolve as individuals, which means as, and as a society. So there's a lot of tumultuousness on the surface, but, but please, I would just say, don't the, the surface level is not the true level. It's not the ultimate level. It's just the, the end. It's just like the highest, it's like the skin, like the epidermis, <laughs> you know, of what's going on. If you look deeper, away from the, the drama of the stage of the play, you, you may find that actually love is growing. And so I think a lot of people um, can take tangible, practical steps in their lives to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. One of them is, I'm not saying don't be informed, but I would watch less mainstream news. <laughs> Just one recommendation. Yes. I don't watch mainstream news. Be, in general, I mean, I do go out and I'm in, I, I wish to be informed and know what's going on. Yeah, I'm the same. But, but um, there is a quality of messaging, which is really important. Think about this. We are all powerful, creative beings. We're like little creation engines. Every one of us, like a little creation engine. And millions of people are tuning into the news and the news. So one person made a fear-based decision and murdered somebody else. And then they put that on the news and now 2 million people hear about the murder and think upon murder. So it's, I'm not saying it's unimportant that that happened. That's very important that that action happened and that and we mm. should do our best for that person. If we have the opportunity, I'm not, I, I'm not saying that, but there is a certain irresponsibility when 2 million people spend 10 minutes of their day focusing on murder. Mm. because I'm just saying that there is, there, there is a, um, our focus is powerful. We'll put it that way. And our focus is important. What we're focusing on is important. And we are little creative, powerful. I say little, we're actually not little. We're, <laughs> we're like, we're like um, galaxies, each one of us who have yeah. come collectively to create this world. And so we tend to get lost in the focus of all the negative is what I'm saying. That gets put back up into our face over and over and over again. We could put that down for every one robbery. There are thousands of safe days yes. for every person who is harmed. There are thousands of people helping other people that we don't, that we don't um, publicize in the same way. You know, mm -hmm. fear is stimulating. It's a, it sells, it's an itch. So we put it on TV and now we want to sell commercials. <laughs> Screw that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we are powerful, loving beings. Um, so one of the things we can do then is choose where, where we focus and, and then also we can identify what messaging are we putting on the tumultuous surface? Because 
we have power in the messaging that we, that, in the way that we label it. That's important. Okay, and one other comment. This is super, super important. We tend to feel powerless because we think, oh, I can't go out and change the whole world. You know, I, I can't go make a new political system. I only have one vote, <laughs> whatever. You know, like we don't <laughs> think we have much power. Okay, here's the thing though. This is super important. The physical is not primary. What's primary is consciousness. Consciousness is first and the physical arises from it and through it. And so the reason I say that is you are an important part of the consciousness of humanity, the collective consciousness. If you imagine like, like a pond, you are a drop in the pond. And so what happens in your consciousness is important and powerful. If you face your own fear, you are changing the light of your drop in the pond and the whole pond can see it actually. So you, oh. so people may not be able to physically, like we may not be able to physically see it, but the thing is your being is much deeper than your physical eyes. We are all connected energetically. We're communicating energetically all the time. I'll just give one uh, just quick example because that may sound like, what do you mean? Um, I was, I participated in a mediumship circle one day where I was just in a state that was an altered state. One of the members of our meditation group said something about China and I saw and heard and felt her thought reach around and touch China, like the, like the body of what China was in the collective consciousness. Wow. And I, and I was like, holy crap, her thought is a thing. Like, awesome. like it really is. Like I saw it, I heard it, I felt it. I was aware of how that energy nudged the whole China. All of China got nudged <laughs> a little tiny bit. So I'm just saying that because it's like, we think this is like, like we can't see it. So it must not be real. No, it's real. It's just that it's at a level of being that is not commonly perceivable in the physical. So I'm saying that because your thoughts are powerful. Your, your processing of your fear is powerful. If you move towards more joy and fun in your life, you are helping the collective heal. <laughs> like it may not be obvious, but if you can even, you don't even have to be around anybody. You just like go smell the flower and appreciate it. Go pet the dog, love the dog, whatever. Be open to life in that moment. When you're open to life in that moment, that light shines down through your drop energetically. There's a pitch change. It's like the water changes temperature. Yeah. And when your drop changes temperature, the whole pond changes a little bit. And the higher vibration we are, the more empowered we are to face and process that all that old crappy garbage stuff that seems to be so prevalent. It just gave me a thought like, if there's something that I'm scared of, I'm going to be like, oh, I'm going to go jump in there right now. And I'm just going to handle <laughs> it face first. Just get in there. This is going to be great. Can. I'm changing humanity. <laughs> you are. No, yeah. I, I, and I'm saying that because like, we all feel like so many people feel so powerless. Like, yeah. oh, I'm just one little person in this big old world. I can't change it. You can change the world. You just, and, and when I say like, you just change yourself, that may feel like, oh, that's so small. No, you are a part of the world you are important. You really are important. But here we are in a world where billions of people have forgotten how important and how powerful they are. Yeah. And we run around sloppily focused on consumerism and, and, you know, like, oh, like I'm going to wear nicer clothes than you and, you yeah. know, physical, physical positioning, whatever. That's all like, whatever. That's a big, it's like a big distraction. The, the truth of the love of who we are is more powerful and more real than the superficiality that we've normalized. We just have to take our own personal step back in that direction in our own day, like in time, like actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's Absolutely beautiful. It's incredible. a message of hope. Yeah, definitely. Uh, another question I have, it may not be approved by some, but it's something that's been brought to my awareness that is we are eternal limitless beings mm -hmm. are we particles of god source energy and if so could it be that we are god source experiencing all potentials of possibility of creation 
yeah, so like I said, language is ridiculously limiting, but to be crude about it, yes. <laughs> yeah, we are pieces of source. Um, I love the Rumi quote. I put this in my book like three times because this quote is so powerful and full. You are not just a drop in the ocean. You are the mighty ocean in the drop. Awesome. Amen. It's not, Amen. and that's not a matter of, you know, arrogance or something. It's just what you are. Yeah. So yes, from your perspective, source is seeing and knowing itself and all of reality all, all that is becomes more through you it's beautiful yeah it really it's is. a beautiful thing yeah yeah um a chapter in your book that jumped out at me page 95 i am therefore i think such an incredible insight this is sort of likened to the law of attraction. Um, now, I'm all about the law of attraction, but you say it's back to front. So the law of attraction teaches you think and then you put the thought into action and then, mm -hmm. you, you know, it comes to you. Whereas you say, I am, therefore I think. Could you elaborate on that? Sure. Yeah, the, the, the statement I made is just a one more layer back. Uh, so being this is first. So you are, you exist, you're conscious. <laughs> That's first. Yeah. That, that, that beingness is full. Uh, we could say from a materialistic standpoint, it's empty. I don't like the word empty ever with, in the context of spirit, because it's not empty. It just transcends the form that is within it <laughs> yeah. fully. So transcendent beingness engages form, whether that be the form of the physical or thought objects. Okay, so I know that when the law of attraction is discussed, we tend to focus on the idea of thoughts as things, and they are things. But there's something that precedes a thought, and that is an intention. And what I mean is consciousness has to move in some way. It's the best way. I don't, I don't know what words put on it but beingness has to like move in a direction do something mm. let there are layers of intention that lead to form and then that can issue more intention which leads it's a huge cycle it's a huge it's a churning of creation there are layers and yeah. layers and layers and layers of form so the physical is it's not like there's the physical and then there's like one other you know layer and that's it there are many layers of creation. Okay, so I'm saying that because beingness exists, then it wields an intention, and the intention in our in our reality might might yield a thought. So let's say that you really want. I'm just being a little bit facetious, but I've heard this said. Let's say you want really want a new car. So you think about wanting a new car. Okay, well, it's true that thinking about wanting a new car is creating a thought form about a new car. But what the universe is listening to is not the object of the car. It's listening to your intent. Ah, interesting. So your intent may be, I'm afraid I won't be able to get to work. <laughs> Please give me a new car. Oh my gosh, I'm afraid. Please give me a new car. Oh my gosh, I'm afraid. Please give me a new car. That's what, <laughs> that's what the universe hears. Like there's not a trick. You can't trick reality. Like reality, like your intention is your, is your intention, whatever it really is, like it, whatever it really is, <laughs> whoever you really are, that's who you are. You can't yeah. like your ego may spin all sorts of stories. Oh no, I want a new car because, because I'm abundant, whatever reason. Yeah. yeah. But the quality of your intention is what the universe hears. Now we are abundant life filled <laughs> beings. That is our true nature. It is absolutely um, wonderful that we live abundant lives full of health and physical abundance and all of that. I'm not, <laughs> not saying that. I'm just pointing out, though, that it's not just the mechanism of a surface thought. It's who we are that's pushing reality. Uh, Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Labs, uh, Pair Labs, Princeton, they did 
a number of years of experimentation on psi phenomena, that is consciousness affecting the physical world, 25 or 30 years, I forget how many, but one of the findings I remember hearing about in their research was that um, people did affect outcome, but half the, roughly half the people affected it in the direction they intended, and roughly half the people affected it in the opposite direction that they intended, but it was measurable. <laughs> I'm, I'm generalizing. I don't know the exact details, but but Tom Campbell was talking about that. And he was basically saying, because the people who pushed it the opposite direction, their intention was, I'm afraid I won't succeed. Yeah. Yeah. So they pushed towards that direction of not what they were consciously, <laughs> just, you know what I'm saying? And this is one of the reasons why processing fear is first. <laughs> yes. it's, not just about, it's not just about getting the things. It's about who we are. If you process your own fear, you're much more able to be in a state of clarity from which you can manifest. Absolutely I'm not saying incredible. I'm a master of manifestation. I'm just saying that <laughs> quality of being is first. Now, mm -hmm. ironically, when you find the trueness of who you really are, you don't need much, if anything. Yes. You, you just are full and it's from that fullness of life that then life can express back to you what what you are already uh like this reminds me of another phrase that tom campbell said this reality is built to give you what you fear <laughs> oh, you know, I a love lot of people that. a lot of people don't like that idea guess what it's <laughs> it's okay. It's not that it's not that it's masochistic or cruel. Actually, reality is not built on cruelty. But if you have fear, which just means yet unevolved in this, this is the place where it gets pitted. It gets like uh, engaged, and that fear um, will tend to yield certain experiences that will help you, give you the opportunity to face it. Uh, yeah. So, like in my case, I came to face a fear in this life. That was my main intention was there was a certain very, very low vibration fear I came to process. I inadvertently had been nudging the probabilities for 22 years up until I was 22 years old for a great trauma that happened to me when I was 22. Mm. Um, it was tr deeply traumatizing at the time, but now I'm able to see it, it was an opportunity. And it was an opportunity that I knew before life was like, I know this is going to sound crazy to the human ego. It's like winning, a, winning the lottery. Like yeah. being given the chance to play a human was like being given a lottery ticket, that, like a winning lottery ticket. Like, oh my gosh. There's, like being given the chance to play a human is like the biggest gift. And even though I knew from there that I was going to be engaging a vibration that would be so hard for me, <laughs> but I was so excited at the opportunity because I knew the, uh, the profound opportunity in it, the profound expansion that could occur through it. Okay, so that was a really long tangent, but it's related to your original question. Oh, that <laughs> about, was just awesome. About really, really is. Yeah. Um, you mentioned fear and ego. And, you know, how do we let go of that ego and the resistance that the ego gives us? How can we let go? Because life has its way of throwing situations at us. Um, how do we flow, so to speak? Yeah. Okay. So uh, again, I'll just disclaim that it's a very personal question because each person's walk is very unique. So everyone's way of processing their lives, processing their fear, integrating their experience and growing towards love will be unique. Mm -hmm. But in general, the, the comments we, we made before about rejection apply. Like you put it this way, life is not your enemy. It's not your enemy. So as things arise in life, you don't have to fight as a separate self against them. You can recognize you are always the powerful knower of the experience. You get to apply all the interpretation in every moment. You get to decide what you will do with this moment. Now, you may have a lot of momentum built up. <laughs> you know, over a lifetime, we think the same thoughts thousands of times. We have this conditioning, like we, like, you know, like we talked about. 
So we get this huge amount of thought momentum, interpretation momentum. We wear a deep path in the grass. The path is well-worn. So when things happen, we tend to fall back into the path that we walked. We walked the path. Yeah. But the cool thing is, just like a path of open grass, you can walk right off the path. <laughs> you don't have to stay on the path. You can walk in a new direction. You can choose a new positive interpretation, a new momentum. And when you do that at first, you're walking through fresh grass. So, you it know, it's pokey. <laughs> it's pokey. It feels good, but it's also pokey. And it's like, <laughs> this is new. But this in this moment, you can build up new momentum. That meditation is kind of like that too. You, you are learning, you're, man, learning is a bad word. You're, you are developing a momentum of focus. Mm. Like at first you're in the river, the river of the thoughts is just hitting you, hitting you, hitting you, hitting you. It can't stop just getting hit in the face with water all day long. It's like a whirlpool. I've used this metaphor many other times, but I think it's a great metaphor. It's like when you're a kid and you're in a pool and you go around in circles and you create a momentum in the water yeah <laughs> and then you just and then you let go and you let the water carry you around in circles <laughs> yeah. our momentum is like that our thoughts are like that we just get carried around in circles but what happens if you stand still in the water the water hits you in the face <laughs> you know, tries to barrel you over but just by standing still you are taking energy out of the water okay so well, meditation is like that. So that's a related comment to how can we meet the circumstances of our lives? Because it's our interpretations get so deep, we lose sight that we're even applying them. Stand still in the water. Just, just now, don't worry about the whole thing. Just right now, just, just right now, stand still in the water. Change your focus. Feel the life in you. Feel the, feel the love you have. Feel the... A sensation of breath feel the aliveness in the air the aliveness in your hand in your fingertip like direct yourself to that just for a moment it changes the momentum anyway that's just that's just that's just one comment <laughs> he's such an incredible speaker i just i'm so glad that i got to connect with you today because the way in which you answer questions and explain in such good and deep detail is so good for everyone watching because now they get a little more understanding into why we're here what's the purpose how do we just let go and just just enjoy yeah. life yeah and, and i yeah. just want to encourage whoever's listening it's um like Whoever you are, you are not just a story. You really are powerful. You really are loved. Like you are so loved. <laughs> it's, it's, it's ridiculous how much you are celebrated and loved and, and how precious you are. I, I, just, I just hope that you take a moment to like just recognize that just a little bit. Just tap into it. Even if you think it's impossible. Even if you think, oh my gosh, there's no way. My whole lifetime has proven to me that I'm not worthy of love. No, you are worthy of love. Allow yourself to feel that and know that a little bit so that today, just you can just be more yourself. You can go have more joy, take life with less heaviness just for today. You know, like we, we have that power. And that's not like, that's not certain. That's not specific to just only to any one of us. We all are that. We are all free, multidimensional beings. We're all brothers and sisters. So we're in this together. <laughs> you know, we can do what we can with this very dense experience we've created here. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you for your work. I said no. this before. I know that your channel is relatively new. I feel that there's you know, a real opportunity and you're helping people and sharing this message and sharing the, the realness of our higher natures with people is so powerful and important. Like, like here on earth, I feel like there's only really two problems. The one is fear and the other mm -hmm. one is ignorance. <laughs> That's it. We just don't know who we are and we have fear. So if we can like share a message like this, we're like getting right to the root of the, of the problem by helping people become aware of who they really are again.
And also by knowing, like reminding people, they don't need to be afraid. Yeah. Like that, this is the real work, the work in consciousness space, the work of encouraging each other and loving each other and opening up a place where we can remind each other, you can be accepted. You don't have to be anybody other than, other than yourself. It's a, it's a really beautiful thing. And you're definitely serving that energy. So thank you so much. That's oh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I do need that from time to time because you know, as we spoke about this earlier, we are bigger than what we think we are. And so it's nice to, to understand that. And I am thankful for what I do and I love what I do. And I also love learning myself as well. And yeah, so thank you for joining me and, and, and sharing your message to everyone watching as well. Have a oh, wonderful a day pleasure. experiencing being human. <laughs> <laughs> you too. I love it. Thank you so much.